Hi, my name is Vita Stram, and I currently work for The Animal's Voice, which is animalsvoice.com. It's a huge resource online. Please visit and use us. Um, I've been an animal activist since April of 87, and a vegan since January 1988. I'll be 62 in August, so it's good for you. Um, I'd like to just start this session off by distinguishing institutionalized cruelty from individual animal abuse. Institutionalized cruelty includes the practices, procedures, and traditions that impact thousands or millions of animals at any given point in time. These practices, procedures, or traditions are legal. They are embedded in the policies and daily activities of governments, educational and religious institutions, in private and public industries, and are condoned or tolerated or even welcomed by most people. And they are driven by profit. No individuals inside institutionalized cruelty are held either morally or legally responsible for animal abuse. On the other hand, individual animal abuse is when someone abuses an animal or animals in ways that may or may not be illegal, but clearly offend most people. The individual animal abuser is held mor morally responsible. Over the past four to five years, I have seen the public's intolerance for individual animal abuse grow by leaps and bounds. More letters to the editor, more classroom curricula are developed, more animal law degrees, more animal law schools, more media coverage, more legislation, more litigation have occurred in the past few years than ever before in history for animal protection. And at the same time, institutionalized cruelty has continued to function without moral accountability as the number of animal victims increases exponentially. As our four speakers give their presentations, I want you to listen to the facts and to consider the lack of moral accountability for the individuals abusing animals in the context of institutionalized cruelty. Um, I just, I'm available to you today. Um, uh, and call me, go to our website, email me with any questions. My favorite conversations are with people who are new to the movement. It's just my favorite people to talk to. So please use me and learn this weekend. Thank you very much. All right, how is everyone? Good, good, good morning. Um, so did everyone hear that Bill Gates purchased USA Today this morning? Did anyone hear this? No. Yeah, he, um, he actually purchases it every morning. <laughs> Some people are a little slower to get the joke, I understand. That's why I wait a few minutes to let it ride out. Um, so my name is Nathan Runkle. I'm the executive director and founder of Mercy for Animals. And Mercy for Animals is a national nonprofit animal advocacy organization. And we are based on the belief that non human animals are irreplaceable individuals with morally significant interests and hence rights, including the right to live free of unnecessary suffering. Mercy for Animals focuses the vast majority of our time and financial resources on farmed animal issues. And the reason that we focus our time and resources on farmed animal issues is because this is the area of institutionalized cruelty in our society where the largest number of animals are being exploited. And these are typically the animals that also have the least legal protection and the fewest people that are working on their behalf. This is also the one area of institutionalized abuse that every member of our society plays a role in if they are buying meat, dairy, or egg products. So every person that we reach can decide to become part of the problem or part of the solution. So I'm going to try to stick to my 10 minutes here and give you a big overview of the issue of institutionalized farm animal abuse. So I want to start off just by going over some of these numbers, and I really hate to associate numbers to these issues because when, when you boil it down, it's really a matter of individuals. And every single year in the United States, 27 billion animals are killed for food. 
To break this down further, that's about 10 billion land animals every year. The majority of these are chickens. That's 17 billion aquatic animals. And these are animals that even our movement tends to neglect. That's a million animals every single hour and 16,000 animals every single minute. So in terms of all the institutionalized animal abuse areas in this country, over 99% of animal cruelty and exploitation occurs to farm animals. As the saying goes, one death is a tragedy, but a million deaths, or in this case 27 billion, is just a statistic. So I think it's easy for us to relate to those individual cases of animal abuse that we may see on the news, but it's harder for people to start to really grasp the abuse of uh, farm animals on an institutionalized level because the numbers are just so massive. So what is life like for these 27 billion animals? A lot of people still have images of farm life like this in their minds. And back in the 1940s and before, this was how the vast majority of farm animals were raised in this country. About 60 to 70 percent of the population was involved in agriculture or one way or another. But after World War II, there was a huge shift in agriculture to the point now that less than 2 percent of the population is involved in agriculture. Yet we see the number of animals continue to skyrocket. So now this is what an average quote unquote farm, or now what we've referred to as factory farm, looks like. If you drive by on the road, you actually will have no idea that millions of animals are inside of these facilities. The only thing that would give you any sort of indication that there are animals there is the pungent smell from the odor. With factory farming, there has become this view in agriculture of animals as commodities, as resources, and as production units, whose sole focus and sole purpose is to produce as much meat, dairy, and eggs as quickly and cheaply as possible. So the industry now views these animals as little more than machines. This is a quote from Hog Farm Management Magazine. This is from the industry's own mouth. They said, forget the pig as an animal. Treat him just like a machine in a factory. Schedule treatments like you would lubrication, breeding season like the first step in an assembly line, and marketing like the delivery of finished goods. So you can imagine when an industry starts to view living, feeling, thinking beings as mere commodities, the level of exploitation and abuse goes through the roof, as you will see. With this view as animals as machines have, has also become this sort of genetic manipulation of animals. So we now see birds, pigs, cows that are suffering from chronic pain and distress just from their body weight because these animals have been bred to grow so large so fast. I want to start out by talking about the poultry industry and before I talk about what life is currently like for those nearly 10 billion chickens, I want to talk about what life should be like for these animals. Few people ever meet a chicken, they ever get to know these animals, but in reality chickens are extremely intelligent. They have a language that is unique to their own. Chickens that we know of have at least 30 different calls, which means specific things equivalent to words. They, can, they have calls for overhead predators, ground predators. They actually start to communicate back and forth with their chicks while they're still in the egg. Um, these birds also have complex cognitive behavior. In fact, in 2005, scientists called for a remapping of the entire bird brain because 75% of their brains are used for cognitive learning behavior. We, previ we previously thought that only about 10% of birds' brains were responsible for that. These animals also um, communicate more intimately with chickens that they know. They have foresight. They understand that recently hidden objects still exist. This is something that is beyond the ability of small children. They also have culture. They pass information along generationally to their young. 